Hi, uh, Doug Elk Canoe Rec um, in Lake Minnetonka. And like the previous talk, we, we were completely into the, since they're boats, they move around, or canoes, they move around. So we understand that broader perspective. The site itself, uh, well, first of all, this is us. We're a small group, including our cats. Uh, and you see Kelly Nahowig, he's got, he's right there in some scuba gear. He's the person that found the uh, dugout canoe. Our sonar survey that we've done, we've done Lake Minnetonka over so many times, different directions with our sonar survey, different pieces of equipment. Um, but Kelly uh, was doing some scuba diving on his own because he will do that all the time. Yeah, he, he'll do shore dives uh, from the moment ice leaves the lake and, and the moment uh, <laughs> When ice is floating on the lake, yeah. he'll be in the wind. So, but he came across the, the canoe that had been uncovered by prop wash, we think, because it had been buried. I'm disappearing again. Yeah, I am here though. Anyway, so we're not giving exactly where the site is, but it is located there uh, in this big lake. And of course, 96 wrecks to date uh, for Lake Minnetonka. One of them we haven't, two of them we haven't documented very well yet, but we've got 96 so far and we're working on more. So the pre-excavation sonar, obviously you can see, you can't see anything there. It, it's there, it's just not seen by the sonar. Got a lot of weeds in the area too. And uh, that was, uh, I think one of the factors why Kelly, who usually uh, swims around in that area, uh, he didn't see it right away um, for probably for years since he's been uh, diving in that area. And that's why prop wash. Um, we were having it. We always had a big trouble with prop wash um, in shallow areas, of course. And the, this part of the lake is restricted speed, but we still um, have bad prop wash. I mean, even with slow speeds, prop hit prop wash hits the bottom of the lake easily. We have prop wash for large boats uh, recorded by our sonar, we'll, we'll go through their path, hits the bottom of the lake in 60 feet of water when, when a big boat uh, is going fast. So prop wash is, is evil. But pre-excavation, we uh, dove on the, the site and just you know took photos, 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 video. Well, well first of all, Kelly did uh, find uh, this here and uh, he, took, he took a picture of it and uh, notified us and we, uh, he said, what's this? I said, we, we freaked out. I screamed from one room to the other, Chris, Kelly found a dugout canoe. Um, so we were thrilled. Uh, it's the only one we found in situ so far. There are, we've documented all the known dugout canoes in Minnesota and even outside Minnesota that came from here that we could get to anyway, and radiocarbon dated them. And that's a whole nother project. So this was a great addition to that being in situ. So you see it was, it was partially exposed by the prop wash. Um, during the excavation, we then obviously took our boat uh, with our sonar over the site um, as we we're excavating. And you can still see um, there's a round bit. I see that kind of a curve. That's actually where we have moved matrix. It's actually, you know, but the the dugout itself is in the middle of that, that area. Um, they can, and we also, um, towards the end of the uh, excavation, we also piled rocks along the underside of the uh, end of the canoe that has the rock in it as a means of uh, supporting that area. So it uh, hopefully will stay put. Yeah, and during the excavation, we put garden edgers, actually. We had a whole bunch left over here at our house. So we piled them up and took them out with us and are using it as a, a silt barrier. Um, and we left those there. Those are still down there. We buried them up. So um, to, to protect the, the, the wreck as much as possible, um, if you look, how clear the water is here because it's 11 feet deep. It's a sandy bottom, sand, not not silty. It's silty sand, but it's it's it settles out very quickly. Lake Minnetonka, even in shallow areas like if in, in Halstead Bay, West Arm, um, if you're in uh, Jennings Bay, there's one day maybe in May where you can get some good video. Otherwise, it's almost black water diving, if not black water. Uh, so this area of the lake is pretty clear most of the year. And we're very lucky for that to, in terms of photogrammetry. But you can see how, how wonderfully the, the score lines are shown. Uh, and so just fantastic when we found this. And it was a surprise that it wasn't, it was unfinished. Yeah. We, weren't ex we weren't expecting that. And so it's the first one we know of in the United States that's been found that's unfinished. There's one in Europe, I think, that's been found. I was, I've been looking for more sources for that. 
If someone knows of an unfinished one, please tell us. We'd like to know. Okay. Anything? Okay. So after the um, excavation was, was, seriously, we moved by hand. We moved the sand by hand. We moved four feet of matrix from the top of the, uh, and stopped when we found artifacts. We did find artifacts, and we'll show those in a little bit. But when we were done documenting, videoing, you know, draw, drawing, uh, measuring, we reburied the dugout canoe uh, after shoring up the inside because it, it's hollow. I mean, it's been burned. There's burning, like how they make they make dugout canoes. We uh, wrapped up artifacts, put them in a bag, and actually put them back into the canoe. We did not take collect any artifacts. We just collected samples, um, and then covered it with uh, sandbags from the site. You know, sand from the site in sandbags and and rocks. And you'll see that's what it looks like right here. And we did dive on the site one time this past summer while we were doing other work and everything looked good. Yeah, getting, getting, a, getting a layer of silt over it. Already that's, getting that's recovered. It's expected. So we, it's, it's easily refinable, easily re-excavatable, if that's a word, uh, to go, if we ever want to go back and do more work or take another sample, whatever, easily done. So, and, but it's protected in the meantime. Uh, the one fishing lure that's obviously on there, we left there. No point in taking it off because it would hurt the wood. And there's fishing, there's fishing line all over the area. It's by a fishing pier. I mean, I was, you know, pulling, pulling fishing line from all over the place uh, when it was safe. So there's that's that's a concern. Artifacts. Um, the coal is most interesting to me, I think, cut coal. Uh, there was a steamboat coaling area in this area because it served one of the old hotels. So that's interesting. Medicine bottle, not not much. Yeah, Modern like, stuff, more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the can, rusty can, the cut wood, couple of pieces in the matrix above, just dumped there, fell in there, covered up. Uh, nothing had any great stratigraphy to it because the way this area, it'll move all over the place. You know, a golf club, someone got mad whoosh, and threw it in. Who knows? Mm. But I, the forty-seven bottle by Duraglass, that was probably ketchup. Um, and, from the way it looks. So. And there's probably some uh, movement of dirt from the fishing pier that they uh, installed nearby. Yeah, so. because they moved the rocks from the shoreline area and probably dumped them on top of the, near the wreck anyway, if not on top. And then honestly, prop wash has been blowing that away for a while. So it's been, it was buried in at least four feet of matrix, if not more, depending on what part of the wreck you're talking about over, over the last years and stuff, so. Um, just a ske side sketch that we've uh, Chris has made. Uh, there's a the report that we've written. Uh, this work was uh, part of a larger uh, underwater archaeology project from Lake Minnetonka. We created two reports for that project. That project was funded by the Legacy Amendment, um, Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, uh, Minnesota Cultural Heritage Grants, but historical and cultural heritage grants. But we also this work itself, the actual. Uh, time and effort put into it was to, was funded by donated funds from our supporters, uh, by MHM itself from our own coffers, and people like Dr. Ron Shermer who hyped our wood for free, like he does. He's such a great guy. He always helps us out, and it's basswood. Um, MHM paid for the carbon fourteen results uh, from Beta Analytic. You can see the probabilities. Uh, it could be as old as sixteen eighty three site disposition, or as new as in the 1930s, which is, doesn't make sense at all. 1802 to 1850 were because of with stratigraphy using relative dating and using these, uh, using the radiocarbon dating, likely dating 1802 to 1850, could be older, probably isn't slightly newer than that because of where this, this area is, there was a steamboat dock there. There was one of the larger hotels and this was likely buried prior to that and the coal was above the wreck significantly yeah, yeah. two feet so um got 1850s went is sort of contact yeah. a lot of the glass and golf clubs and everything they were close to the surface of the uh, yeah just strewn around so and we kept all that stuff there and actually stuck a lot of it under that tree that's sitting right next door so um sorry i went backwards a little bit okay then the photogrammetry um Chris is do, does the photogrammetry. We purchased Agisoft Metashape, uh, purchased with funds donated by Dr. Natalie Rosen, who's a great friend and supporter of ours. And she also paid for a gaming computer because that's the only way you can get the processing speed. <laughs> Thank you, gamers, uh, that you can afford. And so um, 
Chris does this. I just hand the data to him or whatever. I'm, I'm learning. Yes. <laughs> but you can see what good visibility does. This is a great model. And we can, with, with, you can meta, you can do, you know, you can turn it around if you've got the, the software to do that. So, well, yeah, basically yeah. we had the one stone that was towards the end of the canoe. And about halfway up, uh, we found a uh, chunk of wood that was uh, uh, actually cut, but it seems like they kept it in place initially. They didn't, rem they didn't remove they it. They didn't yet. remove it. So, Right. And then uh, uh, evenly spaced, there are these uh, grooves that were carved. Score lines. Uh, score lines that were uh, carved in the, in the tree trunk there. But as far as doing the photogrammetry part of it, you create, we use still photography and video. Yeah. And Agisoft Metashape grabs the still photos out of it and creates its... its you had some um, tweaking to do. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's, it's better to use still photos, but if you have video, it, it can use video. It's just that it requires a little more uh, tweaking of the parameters, which I haven't fully mastered yet. And we'll see. But it worked pretty good. And the reason it worked really great here is because of visibility. Our problem is always visibility. Um, because you can, we can do 3D scanning above ground, which we're gonna show you what we do is there as well. But underwater, you obviously can't shoot a, a, a laser beam in anything. You can't show, shoot a beam like you can for uh, uh, outside of water. So visibility is key. And you can find, um, we do have a uh, 3D viewer linked on our website where you can open this up and turn it around and do things you want to do with it. And other, other things we've 3D scanned as well. And on this particular image too, we had to keep a sandbag in place to hold that one loose piece. Uh, keep that so from, we kept from, it as part of the site yeah. because it's, it's vital. Um, These are some of my attempts. For a different Rick. And um, I promise they have gotten better. <laughs> but this is when the computer does what the computer does on its own. And you can see uh, who, this video is, is mostly from Josh, right? Josh Knutson, yep. who also helps us with, with Kelly, Kelly and Josh and MHM. All that videography was done on the dugout canoe, all three of us together. Uh, but this is from uh, mostly Josh's video, I think. And you can see he swam in and turned and you can see the turn there. And Chris it, actually produced a better model just yeah. just today and yesterday. Actually. Yesterday, yeah, I, I got it to flatten out a bit better. So, but this was underwater photogrammetry gone bad because yeah, this is kind of how the dugout canoe actually looked like at first. Actually, because we do get these skewed, bowed things. Now you can see though that's a picture of the wreck itself, the uh, double-ended duck boat wreck site. It's in it's in Prior Lake, and it's the one of the older wrecks we found yet. It's probably from the 1870s, if not the 1860s, but. Um, the visit, look at the visibility, you can't see from end to end. Obviously on the dugout canoe, you could. And so, I mean, we can take different pictures and see it, of course, and we have tons of those, but that's why the photogrammetry, I don't, is part of a problem with it not turning out so great the first time around, I think. You know more than I do, but it's yeah, it, just, it, it, it's, it's obvious that there's a little bit. There's different. a bit more work to get around to get it to look right. A little bit of uh, meshing and or tweaking. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. Anyway, our, we also do um, photogram, not photogrammetry, but 3D scanning uh, above ground on land in museums. And I'm trying to show you this with, this is our, um, yeah, I'm trying to see, here I am. This is um, a, a system that we use. It's an iPad attached to what we call, a, which is a structure sensor or an eye sense. And we use that to 3D scan uh, rare Minnesota, boats in museums and private collections and we used on uh, Lake Minnetonka on Big Island of uh, the city of Orono hired us to document um, so even big big pretty good big features um, on Lake Minnetonka on Big Island we did scan see at the, all the it's in our reports if you want to look at our reports they're yeah. all online but Chris has to, does all that too and that I do the other stuff that really is hard he, he pieces those together using mesh lab uh, manually it's not like meta. It's not like meta. Yeah, yeah basically, meta you have to scan sections of these boats and take each section and stitch them together. And this is what he came up with. Great job, I think. Uh, and so we can turn them very different, diff different uh, ways with X-ray vision, or we can go right. We can actually cut away and go into the boat and diff do different cross sections of the boats if we do the scanning right. Um, one problem we did try doing Agisoft Metashape on um, one of the Alumacraft, there's an Alumacraft up there. It's one of the um, uh, X-ray types, uh, the, the grayscale X-ray one. We just did that last year. Uh, does not like shiny objects 
Um, Agisoft Metashape does not like video taken from shiny objects or photos yeah. taken from shiny objects. It didn't work. Or things that are translucent. Doesn't like it, doesn't like glass. So um, we can use Agisoft Metashape to document in boats and museums and stuff like that, but it's gotta be a certain type of boat, wood, not too shiny, not shiny wood, but um, aluminum is shiny. If it's a shiny aluminum is a problem and glass, if it's got a, a, a windscreen is a problem. So, but this is what we've been working on for years. We've been doing this type of thing. So um, that's pretty much it. Um, it's not very long because it's just one, one uh, site. Uh, donate to e MHM if you'd like through eBay. We sell a whole bunch of stuff on eBay and that money goes directly to MHM, all of it. Um, and we also, all monetary and in-kind donations to MHM are tax deductible. And that's about it. We'd like to thank you guys. And the report is listed on our website. There's a link to all of our dugout canoe work and all of our underwater archeology span work. Uh, our website is being reconstructed from scratch. So it's still under construction work in progress. Links to video, links to the reports. We host our reports on the internet archive, but link them to our, web, to our uh, website. And that's about it.